When most people think of bees, this is the image that comes to mind. Hundreds of insects working away in a hive, making honey and serving their queen. This is the story we are all familiar with, but the reality is very different. Honeybees like this one are, in fact, only a tiny part of a much larger picture. Incredibly, the UK has over 250 species of bee the vast majority of which are like this mining bee. At first glance, she may look very similar, but this is a solitary bee. They don't live in hives, and they don't make honey. They live their lives almost completely alone. Some are scarcely larger than a grain of rice. But they are all around us, in our parks and gardens and allotments, each individual laboring tirelessly to provide for their young. They are diverse, numerous, and beautiful. They are the solitary bees. And this is their story. It begins in spring, on a cold, crisp British morning. This is a female red mason bee, and despite having been alive for the better part of a year, this is the first time she's seen the outside world. Understandably, she's very hungry, so her first task is to find food. Like all bees, she sustains herself on a diet of nectar and pollen. But she is not alone on this flower. This is a male red mason bee, and he's easily distinguishable from the female by his white moustache. He emerged a few weeks earlier and has been waiting nearby for just this opportunity. For male mason bees, these brief encounters represent their only active contribution to the next generation. But there are other solitary bees for whom the male plays a far more active role. This is a male wool carder bee. And this is his territory. For a few weeks in the middle of summer, he can be found tirelessly patrolling around flowers like this lamb's ear. He will pause only to sleep and drink nectar. Such constant activity requires a lot of fuel, more than the lamb's ear alone can provide. So occasionally he must forage further afield to maintain his energetic lifestyle. But this leaves his territory vulnerable, and this honeybee has unknowingly stumbled right into it. Despite being armed with a deadly sting, the honeybee is playing a dangerous game, as the male wool carder is never gone for long. As soon as the wool carder returns to his patrol, he senses something is amiss. In a moment, it's over. With the intruder seen to, he can return to his rounds. Lamb's ear is an invaluable resource to wool carder bees. Their leaves are covered in fine silky hairs, ideal nest building material and their flowers are rich in nectar. This combination will inevitably attract a female, and when it does, the male is certain to give her a warm welcome.
Like most solitary bees, this female will raise her young entirely on her own. But thanks to the male defending these flowers, she will have everything she needs to do so. Before any bee can start laying eggs, however, she must first prepare a suitable nest. Solitary bees have evolved a number of strategies to do this. Many simply nest in the ground. These sand mounds were made by Lassioglossum bees. They simply dig a hole in which they build a number of separate chambers for their offspring. Others, like this Osmia bicolor, one of the first species to emerge in the season, will only build her nest in discarded snail shells. For other bees, a hollow tube provides the perfect nesting spot. And these don't always have to be naturally occurring. If you would like to encourage bees to visit your garden, you can install something like this. A bee hotel. Bee hotels make an ideal nesting site for a number of different solitary bees. And this one has attracted the interest of a leafcutter bee. Leafcutters are very common in the late summer, and they can be quite particular about their nests. Before this female commits to building here, she rigorously inspects each potential tube to gauge its suitability. She needs her nesting tube to be clean, free from parasites, and, crucially, to have the right dimensions. It seems this one is just right. Leafcutter bees, as their name suggests, make their nests out of cut leaves. If you've ever seen circular holes like these in rose plants or Himalayan honeysuckle, then you can be sure there are leafcutters nearby. The leafcutter has specially evolved mandibles that are excellent for cutting leaves. They are broader at the tip, with a serrated edge and this allows them to slice through tough plant material with very little effort. Back at the nest, she carefully folds the leaf into place and cements it down with her own saliva. This provides a safe environment in which her offspring can grow up. Earlier in the season, our female red mason bee has also been building her nest in hollow tubes. However, unlike the leafcutter bee, she constructs hers out of mud. If you keep a keen eye out in spring, you might very well see red mason bees like these, mining for mud. They will often return to the same location each time they need to collect more material, making an average of eight trips to build a single cell. Once each cell is constructed, she must then fill it, because in addition to providing her offspring with a place to live, she must also provide them with enough food to last them until adulthood. For solitary bees, this means visiting flowers to collect nectar and pollen. In great abundance. Red mason bees are highly efficient pollinators. A single female is thought to do the work of 60 honeybees. This is believed to be a result of how their bodies are adapted to carrying large amounts of pollen. Underneath their abdomen, they have a special organ called a scopa, a collection of stiff hairs that they load to the limit. Yet, despite this remarkable carrying capacity, it may still take her an entire day to fill just a single cell.
she regurgitates nectar from her crop, which will supply her young with essential sugars for energy. The pollen she has collected will provide her young with protein for growth. This mixture is commonly known as bee butter. What took her an hour to collect is offloaded in a few seconds. And she is immediately off for more. These frequent foraging trips are not without significant risks. Every time our bee leaves her nest, she runs a deadly gauntlet of predators. Crab spiders are excellent hunters. They have evolved to blend in perfectly with the flowers on which they hunt. Despite her death, her legacy will live on. In her short life, she has managed to build and stock a number of cells. And in each one, she has laid a single egg. Spring gives way to summer. And, in time, the eggs hatch into grubs and nourish themselves on the bee butter within. Their mother's devotion and tireless effort have given them the best chance for survival. But her young are not the only ones who will benefit from her efforts. Far from it, in fact. Millions of plants all over the world would not be able to reproduce were it not for bees like her. So much of the beauty and majesty of nature that is all around us would not be possible without the work of this humble and all too often overlooked group of insects. This underlying partnership has given rise to so much of the world in which we live. Without bees of all kinds, our world would be a very different place. The days grow shorter. And summer fades to autumn. In their nest, the red mason young have eaten all their pollen and spun individual brown cocoons. It is here and in this form that they will spend the winter, safe from the cold and wet. until the following spring, when life begins to stir again. The bees are now fully grown, and it is time for them to emerge. The first to hatch are always the males. The mother bee has laid their eggs closest to the nest entrance. His strong mandibles make short work of the cell walls his mother constructed.
As they leave, they create the holes through which the females will emerge in a few weeks' time. A quick drink of nectar, and soon he's on his way. Ready to begin the cycle anew.